So, yes, we are here. Thank you so much for joining us on this interdisciplinary day on audio and video collections. Over the last 10, even 15 years, digital humanities have experienced an incredible gain in momentum and have provided researchers with a vast amount and new types of research data, such as digital editions of text, films, audio and video recordings, poems, musical pieces, and other semiotic artifacts. Today's event is dedicated to the approaches and form of uses relating to audio and video collections. These types of semiotic objects suffer from a knowledge dump condition, a term I coined in an article in 2016. In that article, we argued that although academic video production thrive as an alternative to both face-to-face -face lectures and traditional textbooks, their accessibility in under-resourced languages, such as Hebrew, is metaphorically equal to impounded water in a locked dam. However, in order to avoid a tsunami of unstructured inform information, digital techniques and tools must be developed to enable a controlled accessibility to the information embedded in audio and video. Why audio and video collection and why now? This event is a part of a three-year grant, granted project during which researchers at the Open Media and Information Lab, OMILAB, are exploring innovative research scenarios and interfaces to multimodal digital collections, audio and video included, curated by the National Library of Israel. Second, oral conversations has become a major tool of communication in the past eight to 10 months since COVID-19 has been first into our lives. The educational arena now concentrated in orally based learning tools and not too long until it will seek for analytical tools to these learning objects. Moreover, conducting remote oral history interviewing during the COVID-19 pandemic binds new practices. I want to welcome our guest professor Janice Farnheimer from the Department of Writing, Rhetoric, and Digital Studies at the University of Kentucky. She's also the Sankar Professor and Director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Jewish Studies at Women's Studies at the uh, University of Kentucky, sorry. And she is affiliated to the University of Kentucky Department of Gender and Women's Studies and the Beam Institute for Bourbon Heritage as a faculty fellow. For her contributions, to the archival profession. She has received the Midwest Archives Conference President's Award for 2020. She is an extremely fruitful scholar and has a rich publication list that encom encompasses several digital projects of which she will introduce one project today. So Professor Farnheimer, Jan, will talk about pedagogy and for archival sustainability, the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project Oral History Metadata Synchronizer Indexing and Undergraduate Research. Please. Thank you so much, Merit. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Ofer. Uh, I'm already learning so much today. It is really lovely to be included in the symposium. So I just want to thank you. I know that this has been a long path to coming to fruition. So thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, in a way that you can see hopefully the presentation. I think once I start the presentation, it will um, go into a different format. So just let me make sure that you can actually see the slides. Can you see them, the big ones? It should say pedagogy for archival sustainability. You'd think a few months into this, we'd all be a bit more fluid, but it still takes some time. Um, so as you can see, this is just the title of the talk. And um, I'm gonna, go through uh, how I hope to spend the next 20 minutes with you. I just want to introduce myself and my local context um, first because I'm guessing some of our international participants may be a little bit less familiar with the University of Kentucky uh, and actually some of our American participants as well. And then I'm going to give an overview of the Jewish Kentucky Project, um, the way that we use the oral history metadata synchronizer, which is something uh, developed here at the University of Kentucky Nunn Center and uh, we refer to it lovingly by OMS. 
And then I'm going to talk about the model of sustainable stewardship um, my team developed to help foster student research, collection growth, and community university partnerships. And finally, I'm going to spend the last little bit of it bragging on my students and talking about some of the professional successes that they have um, garnered from being involved with this oral history based undergraduate research. So Without further ado, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast. I had never set foot in Kentucky until about 10 years ago when I interviewed for my job, not at University of Kentucky, but actually at the University of Louisville, which I then didn't take. Um, and then I did a year later take the job here. But I spent my whole life mostly on the East Coast, uh, did my graduate work in Texas. And like many people, I thought, Kentucky? Uh, what am I gonna do there? How, what does this have to do with Jewish community, people, anything? Um, there's a great uh, scholar that actually hails from Louisville, um, Lee Shai Weisbach, who talks about the way that most people don't think about Kentucky Jews, that they actually have a really rich history here dating back at least until the 19th century. Um, so in 2010, I joined the faculty here at the University of Kentucky uh, based on my expertise in rhetoric and writing. Um, they were doing a rehaul of the undergraduate curriculum here. And after a short while, I was asked to step up as interim director for Jewish studies when a colleague went on sabbatical. And then we have this thing here called the curse of competence, which is when you show that you do an okay job at something, they ask you to keep doing that job. And so here I am, nearly 10 years later, still the director of Jewish studies at the University of Kentucky. So I guess I'm doing okay here. Um, but University of Kentucky itself is um, kind of different than some of the universities in Israel and across the world. We're a land grant university. We have roughly 18,000 undergraduates. Um, when you add me uh, medical students and law students onto that, we get close to, I think, over 20,000, 25,000 students, maybe up to 30 with graduate and professional students. The student population, at least the undergraduate population, draws mostly from in-state students. So they come from all across the Commonwealth. They're mostly white and Christian. Uh, the overall population in Kentucky as a whole of the Jewish uh, people is here is less than 1%. So as you can imagine, most students have never really met or encountered Jewish people or practices or culture until they get to UK, at least not in person. They might have seen some things on TV. Um, and often I have students tell me that I'm the first Jewish professor they've ever had or the first Jewish person they've ever met. So as you can imagine, as a director of a program, this presents a little bit of a problem for attracting, recruiting, and retaining students. Um, and in my role as director, that's part of my job. So I began to wonder, how can we change the ideas about Kentucky and its connections to Jewishness so that it becomes not part of these negative stereotypes and biases about Southern Jewish culture that we have nothing, there's nothing going on there, but rather that actually they're deeply interconnected. And I started to think about how I might be able to do these things and also continue my research agenda. I was still a junior professor at that time um, in my own areas of expertise in cultural rhetorics, composition, technology, Jewish and identity studies. And I was becoming more familiar with oral history methods and I was trained in rhetoric and composition methods. And so I started talking actually with a colleague who then later went on to co-found the project with me, Dr. Goldstein, about uh, the pos possibility of doing an oral history project and what that might mean. Um, and we began to think about how such a project might begin to raise visibility and awareness of Jewish Kentucky heritage for both Jewish and non-Jewish people alike. Um, one of the things that I wanted to get people to be able to think about was Jewish heritage is Kentucky Jewish heritage, it's Kentucky heritage, it's Kentucky Jewish American heritage, and it's also American heritage. So trying to think about in these different ways uh, how people could begin to have a more expansive way of understanding what it means to be Kentucky and what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be American. Um, and so in so doing, such a project might help us to rebrand the Kentucky and the University of Kentucky as more welcoming and inclusive places to students and citizens of all backgrounds. And because of my own penchant for uh, working with undergraduates, I wanted to figure out a way to do this that would involve undergraduates in the actual process of using research and creating knowledge production at the earliest levels of their studies. So doing this through oral history methods. And then finally, the collection itself could be used for a model of continued growth. We received some initial grant funding from the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence, um, but we knew that that funding was only going to last for three years. So we really wanted to come up with a method that would allow the program to continue to grow and the collection to continue to grow beyond the period of the, the, the granted period. 
So of course, any good person who wants to try and do something that's interdisciplinary in this way looks for team members because collaborative work requires a collaborative team. Um, Dr. Goldstein was the professor I was mentioning before and, and we had initially started brainstorming this project, uh, walking around our very own neighborhood. Um, I, we ended up working together. She has a background in education policy. She is now happily retired, um, but she has been living in Kentucky for a lot longer than me, um, more than 30 years in the Jewish community here. Uh, our colleagues at the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History, uh, the director there, Doug Boyd and I, have been working together on some other projects involving undergraduates um, using oral history in the classroom, so he was very excited to jump on board. And the University of Kentucky Libraries and Special Collections, the Director of Digital Services and the Curator of Kentucky Jewish Heritage there, Sarah Dorpinghouse. So we had, a, of course, I can't not mention the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence, which also provided our funding. So up to now, we, um, the project has moved into a new phase. We've, we've completed the initial collecting period. Uh, we had initially promised them we'd do 50, 50 interviews over the course of uh, three years. We ended up with 124, and we continue to grow. Of those, 50 or more have been transcribed and fully indexed using the oral history metadata synchronizer, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, which makes them publicly searchable and fully available online. Uh, the interviews themselves represent Jewish Kentuckians from Louisville and Lexington, which are the two largest urban centers in the state, and rural and urban Jews from across the Commonwealth, all the way um, in Paducah, which is in Western Kentucky, to Whitesburg, which is the Appalachian Mountains people more commonly associate with Kentucky. Uh, the 35 of those 124 interviews have been conducted by students, um, and over the course of the, the, the period we've been working, about 80 students have been involved with the project, 48 have presented or published their findings, um, and more of that on the third part. Uh, and finally, I've got a, I dropped a link in the slides there, and it should also be in the handout that uh, Verid shared if you want to click around. But the digital interface that we're working on um, to access these materials, uh, we're calling it the Jewish Kentucky Digital Archive, and here's a little screenshot of what that looks like on the home page. So that's only a few of the 50 that are fully accessible. You can see that our first round of interviewees um, were of the older generation. And in fact, we're really grateful we were able to do that because a few of them have unfortunately already passed away. Um, but probably the thing that Vered was and I were, or Vered was interested in me talking about was this concept of sustainable stewardship, which was the replicable model, replicable Oh, that's such a hard word to say, even when you're a native speaker. Repli replicable model for oral history course and project design um, that engages undergraduates in every step of the process um, in original research and knowledge production while also making the collection itself much more accessible for researchers. And how did we do this? Well, one big part of it was we developed two new classes, um, both of which that I teach. Um, that allow the pedagogy of the class itself to have students involved in both authenticating transcripts, indexing the interviews themselves, and then also creating new interviews that are then added to the collection. Um, so that, that's kind of the linchpin of the process that makes it sustainable, is that they're taking interviews that have already been conducted either by another class or by professional oral historians, and they create the indexes, which then make them uh, searchable for themselves and for other researchers, and then later in the semester, they go ahead and work either individually or with team members to do oral histories with another community member that then becomes part of the collection. So I developed two different courses. One is a first year writing course that's part of the required sequence here at UK. Um, it's the honors version of the course. And in that, uh, that class, the students go through this series of assignments. So first they're assigned an interview that was already done. They listen, they have the transcript that's professionally prepared. They authenticate the transcript to make sure that it actually contains all of the nonverbal utterances that we just heard um, Professor over here talking about. Um, and then they go ahead and index it. So they segment it, they create all the keywords, they create uh, segment synopses to make it usable for a researcher. Um, and then they do an analysis of that uh, indexing. 
And then finally, they work with their own colleagues to create an oral history of their own with a, or a community member. And the final project of the semester asks them to take their own interview and put it in conversation with other interviews, either from the collection that existed beforehand or that their peers did, and to create an audio cast or a podcast aimed at a public audience. So that's the first year students. And then my more advanced students, my upper division students, who tend to be English education majors based on the way the uh, curriculum is set up here at UK, uh, they take a class called Composing Oral History where they locate and digitize uh, archival material. So they spend a, a fair amount of time in the archives. Uh, Sarah Dorfenkaus and I have been working together to uh, accumulate archival materials from the local community. Many of those materials exist and have been uh, processed at the archives, but they've not yet been digitized. So the students work to digitize the materials and incorporate them into the indexes that are created with ohms. Uh, they go through a similar assignment sequence, except instead of doing an audio cast as their final assignment, they do a digital exhibit. Um, and you'll be able to see those in just a minute. So the big, the big takeaway is that students are both indexing the extant interviews and conducting original oral histories. So the accessibility is growing at the same time as the quantity of interviews is growing for the collection. So I'm sure many of you are very curious now to hear what this oral history metadata synchronizer is. Um, so this is an open source platform developed by Louis B. Nunn Center um, in the 2000s, namely in response to a budget crisis that was cramping the budget for transcription. Um, and I will argue in other places that actually in some ways these indexes are more valuable than a than a transcript itself, because a transcript will only transcribe what the speaker said, but the indexes actually allow students um, or whoever's doing the indexing to create keywords that make them accessible for what they talk about but isn't said. So they may talk around issues of anti-Semitism but never ever use that word, and so an indexer can introduce that word into the keywords and make them much more searchable. Uh, OMS itself allows for searchability and access by allowing the indexer to create keywords, um, provide summaries and synopses. Uh, you can also add contextualizing links, GPS coordinates, um, and it gives the students the opportunity to provide um, and to author very important metadata. Uh, based on the work that we've been doing in the classrooms, the design team that created OMS actually went back and added a couple of screens, uh, one, the most important of which is the acknowledgments um, section, which actually credits students for the work that they do on the indexing. So if you go to our page, um, you'll see here's an interview with Eugene Duval, who attended the University of Kentucky in the 50s. Uh, he was the president of Hillel, which is a Jewish student organization there, and also a member of the Zeta Beta Tau fraternity, which is a Jewish fraternity on campus. Mind you, this was at a time when Jews were not allowed to join any other fraternities. They were not into, allowed into the regular fraternities because they were Jewish. Um, and he moved to Kentucky from New York. And you can see down here, uh, that when you look at these uh, indexes when they're complete, they look a little bit like a book. Uh, the students are responsible or the indexers for creating this kind of table of contents, which is searchable itself. If you toggle over here, um, if we were actually on the, if it wasn't a screenshot, you could actually toggle back and forth between the transcript itself and the index and search with inside. Um, oops, hang on, come here. So if you go within the segment itself, um, you will see that you get something that will orient you. So this tells you, here's the partial transcript from the segment that I'm talking about. So here's the segment where he arrives at the University of Kentucky in 1950. Here's the segment synopsis, which is a summary of what's discussed in that segment. Um, and if we go to the next one, if we were to scroll down, you would see here are the keywords. These are generated by the student, by what's actually said in the interview itself. These are the Library of Congress subject headings. The students don't put those in. When we turn uh, the student work over to the Louis B. Nunn Center, they coordinate so that they're lined up with the Library of Congress headings. Um, and as you can see, this student provided a GPS link to the University of Kentucky. And if I were continue scrolling down, there was an archival image from what the University of Kentucky looked like at that time. And if we go to the actual digital interface, there's, before you get to the interview itself, you can click on something that says description, and that will allow you to see an overall description of the interview itself, also authored by the students. And then down here is that special uh, little, little interface that they 
they added to make sure that the students actually got credit for authoring these works because they're pretty time intensive, as you can imagine, um, and also incredibly valuable. So that brings me to my next section, talking about the students themselves. I think, yeah. Um, and so what I found that having the students use OMS and use oral histories in classes allows them to access new primary research methods. Um, because it's a required class, students in first year writing come from all across the university. So many of them may be medical students or pre-med students or science students. And they, their ideas about what research is usually is focused on the lab itself. It enables students to generate original research materials, creating oral histories, discovering and digitizing archival materials and creating podcasts. It gives them opportunities for public presentation and publication. Um, like I said, it helps to redefine their knowledge and history. Their knowledge of history is something that's collaboratively authored and culturally constructed. It facilitates um, ethical cross-cultural interaction with the minority community many of them have never experienced. And it teaches basic professional communication skills. They have to send an awful lot of email to coordinate the logistics for those interviews. Um, and it gives them some good practice. So, in brief, it allows them to process and provide the access to oral histories, to develop interpretive and summary skills, to create indexes for oral histories, thus making them more accessible, to author the descriptive metadata that allows researchers to find the oral histories, to conduct original oral histories themselves, and to collect to, to help us allow the collection to be sustainable and continue to grow, and to digitize and integrate relevant archival materials with oral history, and to create publicly, uh, public, public works, uh, either in the form of the audio cast or the Omika exhibits. So here are just a few pretty pictures of students hard at work. Um, here at the Lexington Public Library Special Collections, obviously these images are from several years ago and well before COVID because they're physically in the archive space and unmasked. Um, that same student, you can see Jacob Ward on the right there. He started with a project, uh, continued working with me in independent study and ended up presenting his paper along with another student, Jeremiah Brown, at the 2016 Rhetoric Society of America as an undergraduate. And his business, his background was in business. He was an accounting major. He had never encountered oral histories, um, but he got really interested. He was a fraternity guy and was really interested in the history actually of Eugene Duval. And you can see there's Eugene with his 1952 yearbook picture right there in Jacob's slides. Um, a, a group of students, um, undergraduate and graduate, with Dr. Goldstein and I at the Southern Jewish History Society, um, they held their, we, we worked with them to enable them to have their first ever undergraduate poster session because they weren't used to accommodating undergraduate research at the conference. Um, and here's another student uh, like Jacob, Hannah, there on the left um, with the blonde hair. Um, she was from Paducah, Kentucky, a place that isn't really, um, has actually the third largest Jewish population in Kentucky after Louisville and Lexington, but it's not super well known. Um, and she got really interested in the, what she called the hidden Jewish history of her town. And so she went on to do an undergraduate research project with me and created uh, actually a, a very uh, well regarded research poster. She went on to present at the National Conference for Undergraduate Research, the Undergraduate Research uh, uh, Conference at UK and also um, the, a very special thing at the Capitol in, uh, in Frankfurt, Kentucky. Um, and here she is with another Hannah who did work on the Jewish hospital in Louisville. She was, both of them were pre-med students. They're now in medical school. And Hannah Thompson on the left was very interested in why, why are there things, these things called Jewish hospitals? Why do they exist? And why is there one in Louisville? Uh, she went on to get the Dean's uh, Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Research for her research on Jewish hospitals. So these are just a few of the students. Um, and now let me give a little prelude to Madison, who's talking next. Um, she gave a presentation on the work that she did in her first year writing class right at um, the Kentucky Jewish History Symposium on UK's campus that Dr. Goldstein and I organized in 2018. And there she is presenting with her colleague, Madison. And that's my talk for today, Whew, right at 20. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I'm going to stop. Any, so quest any question from the audience? Uh, wait, we will 
get back to the okay sit your view raise your hand if you want to ask questions or write it on the chat amazing project yes Nita but you have to unmute we cannot hear you yet Wait a minute. Uh, I just want to say that this is really amazing project. It sounds <laughs> terrific. Very interesting. So thank you very much. Thank um, you, Lisa. I'm trying to see who you are. Oh, there you are. Um, someone, I have to, okay. We're still on a share screen, so I want to go back to the... Oh, I did that? And to ask Nita what you... Yes, Nita, I can... No, I, we cannot hear you. You're muted, Nita. Okay, later. Maybe on the chat. Okay. Sorry, Barry. I just went to show screen because I didn't know if people wanted to see a little show and tell. And I didn't know. This doesn't always cooper mm -hmm. cooperate. Um, but I can do that if people are interested. Okay, so Hanania Zaltzer, Hanania Zaltzer is asking, did you consider using some kind of ontology foundation in addition to indexing? why yes or no so can you explain to me a little bit more about what you mean by ontology foundation it's not Hanania, you want to unmute yourself and to ask orally mm. I... no microphone okay so um no problem um, I don't, I'm not as familiar with ontology. I can tell you that the ohms, the, our choice to go with ohms for indexing was very practical. Uh, Doug and I have been working together since about 2013, uh, which is when I said, you know, I'm really interested in changing things up in my first year writing classes. I want, to do, I want my students to have an opportunity to do public writing. I want them to have something that's going to have a real audience. And he said, you know, We've been working with this thing called ohms. It seems like it might be interesting to you. And he did a little demo of what ohms is and what it can do. And I said, okay, I'm in. Let, let's see, let's, he said, you know, we didn't really design this with a student audience in mind, um, but I think that this could work really well in the classroom. And I said, okay, great. I'm here to be your guinea pig. Uh, or more accurately, I'm here to volunteer my students to be guinea pigs with me. Um, and so that's how we started. So it, it was a very pragmatic consideration. Okay, so here's a question from Nitsa. Thanks for the interesting talk. Are you considering a, a way of collectively researching the discourse of the interviews? Did yeah. You find common traits? Yes, so this is a very interesting um, idea. One thing that we've been kind of playing around with a little bit and haven't made that much progress with is um, and, and maybe some of the folks here will talk about it more later, but the idea of audio tra or auto transcription and that here we have a somewhat limited discourse community. There are, um, and in fact, I know, I don't want to steal Madison's thunder. I know she's going to talk about some of the specific vocabulary in the interviews themselves, but there are a lot of, you know, Yiddish, Hebrew, other kinds of words. And if we can get a controlled vocabulary, there is a controlled vocabulary function in when the students are generating keywords, we, created on the back end a controlled way of, of spelling things like Hanukkah or um, that, you know, okay, everyone in English transliteration spells every which way. How many N's, how many K's, how many, is there a C? No. Um, but in terms of, of the big overall project, that's, that's kind of the next stage. We, my, my focus for the last few years or the team's focus has just been in building the collection itself to create some visibility. Uh, whether it's me or someone else who goes in to do the larger project to look at Jewish Kentucky as a as a corpus of interviews, um, we'll, we'll have to see. Sorry, sorry. Yes, so we have a few minutes if you want to show show us um, the online um, platform. Sure. So let me show you first. All right. So here, if we go to Ohms itself, um, oops. Come over here. If we go to the page in um, the Louis B. Nunn Center itself, this is what the interviews look like. So you can see all 124 of them, I believe, most of them are now available online. So if you click here and it says online, you should be able to go 
and it will give you this lovely little thing to either play the interview and that will take you to the OMS viewer. But we found that that wasn't as, as pretty or as useful as the digital interface that we've been developing over here, which looks a lot nicer when you've got the faces associated with the people and you're able to scroll through. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense, here's uh, Larry Cass. He's retired, but he works for Heaven Hill uh, uh, Spirits Corporation, which is one of the largest family-owned uh, spirits companies in the, in the, it's the fifth one in the world, and they're owned by the Shapira family, uh, which has lived in, in Kentucky since the 19th century. But if we uh, click down here in the segments, um, let's see if I can find one that's got some links here. You can see that what the students are able to do is create these GPS links that you can actually click to within the interview itself. So if you're listening, you're like, huh, I wonder where that was. You can, and the students have provided a link, then you can go ahead and click on it. Um, they've, here he's talking about something called the Whiskey Jubilee, uh, an organization for whiskey for Jewish people in New York. And then you can click to the article about it. Uh, this is helpful. Some of the archival links aren't working right now. We were trying to troubleshoot the back end why that was. But in several of these, students have actually located archival materials and linked them into the index itself so that while you're listening, you can see the archival uh, materials as well when it's working well. As you can see, we haven't, we, we've been in maintenance mode for a while and, and we haven't been collecting, so we haven't been in as as uh, currently into the archives. I was scurrying around last night getting ready for the talk and going, hey, why are our links not working? And so we've got uh, the tech team troubleshooting what, what happened. I think, I think what happened is that the library changed the way that they named their documents and we haven't gone back into the OMS inventory to change the link names so that they're accurately linking to the right place. Thank you so much, Jen. This is an amazing project. So and we will hear more about it by Madison just right after the 15 minutes break that we take now. Hello, everybody, and welcome back from the break. Just before the break, Professor Dennis Fahrenheimer presented the fascinating project of the Jewish Catholic oral history. I'm happy to introduce Madison Thistel. Madison is a fourth year student at the University of Kentucky, and she participated in the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project. Madison will share her experience in collecting historical evidence and will expand about the platform they set up for the project. Madison, please, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello. I'm also going to try to share my screen so I can share a PowerPoint with you all. Sure. Can you all see the slides? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'd first like to start out my talk by thanking Dr. Silver and the Open University for inviting me to participate in this conference. As an undergraduate, this is really exciting and it feels even cooler to say that this is my first international conference. Um, I was actually studying abroad in Haifa in the spring, so I was really looking forward to seeing everyone in person, but unfortunately, as we all know, um, things did not go as planned, but I'm still really grateful to be here today over Zoom. Um, I also wanna thank Dr. Spernheimer and Goldstein and the Nunn Center for making the experiences I'm about to share with you all available to me. So I'd like to begin by giving a little bit of context for um, how I came to be involved in the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project. My journey with audio composition began in the fall of 2017 during my first year of undergraduate studies at the University of Kentucky in Dr. Fernheimer's class writing Jewish Kentucky. The course was offered to first year students in the University of Kentucky's Honors College as a part of the required sequence in composition and communication. I was in the class because of my Jewish studies minor, but all of my other classmates were in Dr. Fernheimer's class to receive the university's required comp composition and communication credit. Writing Jewish Kentucky is a research-focused class that worked closely with the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project, 
a project founded in 2015 by Dr. Sternheimer and Goldstein in partnership with the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History on UK's campus, where undergraduates like me, as well as graduate students have worked together to further develop the model for student research by contextualizing select oral histories within American and Southern Jewish history. In what follows, I'm going to share what I learned both from authenticating the transcripts, indexing the interviews, and the process of conducting oral history interviews themselves. My classmates and I first started working on authenticating the transcripts for our assigned interviews with the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project, and then we began to index the data with the oral histories. To clarify what I mean by authentication, we each listened to the interviews while reading a professionally prepared transcript um, alongside it to ensure that the transcript represented the actual oral history. I really enjoyed specifically authenticating the transcripts. Um, the Louis B. Nunn Center values the authenticity of the participants of the oral history and believes that the best method for preserving the accuracy and authenticity of the interview is to record all sounds that occur throughout the duration of the session. So this means that every time someone says, um, uh, like, and every time someone uh, laughs, stutters, or even mispronounces a word, that these are all recorded onto the transcript. Um, you, ensuring that these nonverbal utterances are transcribed makes the process of authenticating transcripts more tedious especially since the most common edits involved including the ums, us, and likes. Um, but overall, I enjoyed catching the discrepancies and making the transcript more accurate and accessible. Indexing the interviews within the project was also much more tedious, uh, as it's up to the indexer to decide what are salient and persisting themes of the interview. Once you have split up the interview into these sections, you have to meticulously give them a timestamp a description of the segment and include appropriate tags so they're easily searchable with keywords. And Dr. Fernheimer kind of showed this, but um, Steve Zahn, this isn't from the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project. He's just a semi-famous actor who now resides in Lexington. Um, but this is a good kind of example of what it looks like when you're in Elms and where you can search the index with the keywords. And then if you were to click on the segments, you could see like the synopsis, uh, the segment, the geolocation tags, things of that sort. Um, so although I found indexing to be more cumbersome, it was still satisfying work to complete. When indexing, you have to actually lean into the authorship and come up with keywords, author segment summaries, and splice the interviews. So once I had indexed a whole interview, I felt like I had brought together all the different pieces of an oral history puzzle and made something of real use to the patrons of OMS. Indexing is a task filled with higher order thinking, and this in effect enables you to compose history. I learned how to apply care to the interviews through the authentication and indexing process, and in turn, I felt a deeper emotional connection to the interview as a result. By working with the Oral History Project, I was able to realize that history can be much more moving and tangible than what I had believed it to be up to that point. One thing that was really challenging about the authentication and indexing was encountering the transcription of Hebrew and Yiddish words, and Dr. Fernheimer touched on this a little bit in her talk. Um, throughout many of the interviews, I remember coming across words I'd never heard before, like minyan, pesach, kashrut, mikvah. Um, a lot of times when I would encounter these Hebrew words in the transcripts, the original transcriber's spellings would be inconsistent, leading me to assume that there were misspellings. But this kind of brings up a phenomenon, I think, that is unique to oral history and audio composition, and which is how do we find out the meaning of a word we've never heard before uh, when we don't have access to its correct spelling, just its context. So oftentimes I could piece the clues together uh, for example, Sarah Wagner's interview that I indexed and authenticated, she mentioned her father being one of the men in their small Jewish community to be counted towards Minion. But I remember our class having a discussion on the meanings of these words in order to create better transcripts and indexes. We were all also in need of an intro to Judaism crash course to better understand the holidays and traditions like Kashrut, Passover, Shabbat, even birthright. 
one of my class or once my class had gotten a feel for the inner workings of authentication and indexing, we formed groups and brainstormed each or brainstormed research topics that would incorporate previously cataloged interviews as well as the new interviews we were about to conduct. My group members and I had previously indexed the interviews of Jewish Kentuckians. Um, this is kind of an overview of the podcast and I'll skip around. So my group had indexed the podcast or the interviews of Joel Gordon and Sarah Wagner. Um, and they talked about their perspectives of their Jewish identity throughout their college years. So we decided to adopt a semi-longitudinal approach and decided to analyze the impact of university life and Jewish student organizations on Jewish undergraduates. Earlier that semester, I had become active in UK's Hillel, which is UK's largest Jewish student organization. And I befriended the student leaders. So I encouraged um, our teammates to select students that were involved in Hillel as their new interviewees. Our group decided to interview two then Hillel members, Amy Groswald, who was at the time the president and she's on the right, and Leo Lyons, who was at that time the vice president. An essential part of composing an oral history is formulating the questions for the interview. I remember being surprised by the amount of questions we had to create for an hour long interview, but in the end, I wish we had generated even more. Um, although we anticipated the interviews to be about an hour in length, they were actually around 30 to 45 minutes in length. And initially, initially we thought that we had not asked enough questions, but I realized that in comparison to the previous interviewees who were in their 40s to 60s, um, at the time of the interview, we were interviewing college students who were in their early 20s. So they didn't have the same amount of life experiences as the older interviewees, and therefore they couldn't speak about the same topics that a lot of the other participants would spend time on, like their secondary education, uh, career changes, evolving living situations, meeting life partners, raising children, and even their children's experiences. Although this limited our scope of questions to ask, it also provided us with the opportunity to dig deeper into Amy and Leela's childhood experiences and early schooling and their leadership roles on campus. I found that Amy and Leela both spent more time elaborating on their childhood and college years compared to the interviews I listened to up to that point. Of course, this is due in part to the fact that they have fewer years to reflect on as a whole, but I believe it's also because these memories are also more recent in their minds and thus they may value them even more than someone in their midlife. Most of the interviewees that are cataloged in the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project are older folks, so conducting interviews with peers was bound to introduce new perspectives into the research. Once we had, inter or had conducted our interviews, it was time for our group to compile the information we could gather from the interviews and compose a podcast of our findings. So I'll go to our podcast. Um, the University of Kentucky Nunn Center has professional recording studios that are open to students in their library facilities. So once we had created a script, we recorded and edited our podcast there, which aimed at educating students about Hillel's history and long-term presence at UK. We aimed our podcast at a student audience of our peers and imagined it as an informational episode that delved deeper into Jewish student life at our university. And I'll be sure to include a link to the podcast if you want to listen to it, um, probably after q and but I'll be sure to drop it in the chat. Within the podcast, we provided information on Jewish holidays, traditions and foods, and we gave an inside look into a typical Shabbat dinner hosted by Hello. Today, I think that most students at UK would benefit from this podcast as Jews make up a small minority of the population, both within the state of Kentucky and at the university. And thus many students are not familiar with Jewish traditions, customs and rituals. At the end of class, each team presented what they learned from, composing, uh, from the composing process. The following semester, my teammate Laura and I um, Dr. Fernheimer had a picture of us doing this presentation, 
um, at the Jewish Kentucky Symposium, which was hosted at the University of Kentucky in the spring of 2018. We also participated in a poster session of the symposium where we talked about Sarah Wagner's oral history. In the spring of 2018, Dr. Bernheimer invited me to participate in a recording session that would cover my experiences in writing Jewish Kentucky in the hopes to include some of the undergraduate experience and an edited collection in her book in the works. In the session, I introduced my finding that my classmates and I lacked a lot of knowledge about Judaism. This became an issue specifically in the realm of audio composition when we would have to authenticate transcripts, record podcasts, and conduct our own interviews. For example, one of the two synagogues in Lexington is named Ojave Zion. I specifically remember that even after encountering this name for a semester and attempting the pronunciation several times, some peers were still unable to pronounce it fluidly. I believe that this is to be this is because of a lack of familiarity with non-Jewish students' experience when it comes to Jewish culture. It's under dispute whether Kentucky as a region belongs to the South, Midwest, Appalachia, or maybe all three of these, but we do know that a majority of UK's undergraduate body comes from these areas where students are not widely educated on different faiths and certainly not Jewish culture. Those of us who are Southerners and not Jewish are often not familiar with popular Hebrew or Yiddish words or cultural icons from other regional parts of American Judaism because most of us did not encounter them in the small communities in which we grew up. My passion for religious studies allowed me to seek out UK's Jewish studies program. Um, sorry. <laughs> and educate myself on Judaism, but this is not a reality for most of my peers where Christianity and Christian culture is the default. So when my non-Jewish classmates and I were met with a research project devoted to Jewish oral history, I think we all certainly encountered a learning curve. I have a great deal of respect and appreciation for the medium of oral history that I've worked on the project. And I'm really fortunate that the class introduced me to the work of oral history research early in my career as a college student. I've always enjoyed history and learning and hearing people talk about their life experiences. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be a librarian and I would actually make copies of my favorite books um, with my mom's spare printer paper. So working with Ohms allowed me to feel like a librarian, but this time it was even better because I got to listen to my new books while reviewing and uh, looking for discrepancies in the written copy. It brought me a lot of joy to just sit in front of my computer and review the transcript while listening to the interview. And I think this is because a lot of concentration is required to do this well. You can't think about future assignments or what you'll do once you're done with the interview. You have to remain fully in the present moment and fully dedicate yourself to the spoken and written word. And that to me is basically divine. Um, in psychological career counseling, students often take an exam that measures your aptitude for and enjoyment of six work-related tasks. So authenticating transcripts would definitely fall into the conventional area where you complete tasks that are almost secretarial in nature and could be labeled as mindless. Um, although this work brought me a lot of reprieve from the stressors of my schooling, it was hardly mindless and in fact required a great amount of attention and concentration. Getting to hear someone recount their life is an extremely valuable and vulnerable occurrence. It wasn't until I completed my work with the oral history project that I realized that it's not often that we can learn the major and minute details of a whole stranger's life in one to two hours. It was the vulnerability of the interviews that made me cherish the content of the project. In the field of mental health, vulnerability is viewed as a gift that we give to those we trust. And I think it's really profound that the oral history project was able to facilitate such an open environment, one where a stranger could recount their cherished childhood memories and the workings of their faith to another stranger. This in turn allowed for the creation of such a large audio repository. As a psychology major, I think it's important to analyze my time with the oral history project and apply my findings to the field of mental health. I actually recently switched my major to psychology 
And although I didn't make the switch directly as an influence from the oral history project, as I look back, there were definitely unconscious connections I was making between the nature of the interviews and psychological practices. I mentioned the vulnerability of the interviews, and this is required especially for the interviewees, um, much like what most therapy approaches also require. The nature of the interviews gives way to an interpersonal relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. In the structure of Dr. Fernheimer's class, when we conducted our own interviews, three students were interviewing one person, but outside of the classroom, a more traditional one-on-one -on -one approach is used. The one-on-one -on -one aspect strengthens the relationship much in the way that it does in counseling sessions. As an interviewer, as an interviewer I'm there to ask the right questions to get to know the subject better. The role of the interviewer is not one that provides care of any clinical sorts, but it does require care in the space of the interview. Some lived experiences are painful to reflect on, and it's my job as the interviewer to cherish what is shared and to respect the interviewee. When we, are, when we interviewed Amy Groswald, we asked that she share, if comfortable, any experiences she had with anti-Semitism. Questions like these can lead one to reflect on trauma and even hate crimes. Um, so these questions can are really sensitive area to venture into within the medium of the interview. It's a difficult balance because again, I'm not there as an interviewer to provide care, but it's important to be conscious of the wide range of emotions that are capable of arising throughout the course of a conversation with the goal to learn about a person's lived experience. And Amy also provided a really great quote. I can talk about more of the PowerPoint and the Q&A, but this is my team kind of composing. And Amy Gross was quote that every Jewish student is different. We all have different pasts and different experiences. Um, I think that's kind of a good way to sum up, you know, part of what I learned in this project. So I hope that by now I've given you a taste of my experience with audio composition since 2017. Um, I'm really grateful that as a result of my involvement in the Jewish Kentucky Oral History Project that I was able to realize that history is always evolving and there's a real beauty in art and storytelling, um, specifically oral history. Since Dr. Fernheimer's class uh, was the first Jewish studies course I took at UK, it was also my first introduction to the Jewish studies program and the course influenced a lot of my current passion for Jewish studies today. Um, I'm so thankful that I got to share my experiences with you all today. So thank you again. Thank you, Madison, for sharing your experiences. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody cares to questions? <laughs> thank you for. Uh, uh, I see that we have an, an extra link from uh, Janice. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Can you say some more about the tagging process? What, what kind of tags did you use? Why did you use certain tags? Uh, was it a conceptual or a, a, what was the motivation? Do you mean um, the tags kind of in the indexing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are um, in accordance with the Library of Congress, but my approach to it was I would, once I had decided how the interview would be spliced, um, I would really try to pay attention to what the main themes were um, in that specific section. And then also think about, um, you know, from a research perspective, if a researcher were looking for certain details within this interview, but didn't have, you know, two hours to spend listening, um, what could someone be looking for that would be helpful to them? So that was kind of my approach to the tag. It, it, it was not a closed, uh, a closed set of words that you had to choose from. It's something that you wrote. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So that kind of brings in the authorship role. Um, which I think can be a little bit intimidating um, as an undergraduate because you don't want to leave anything out. Um, definitely you don't want to leave anything out, but overall um, 
I still appreciated that process a lot. And I think it really opened my eyes to, you know, how history is written and how we can help researchers as a whole. Very interesting. I think there is no need to introduce the Bered, Dr. Bered Zilber Barod, the director of the Open Media and Information Lab at Open University. Bered's research, I still I say some words, Bered's research focuses on various aspects answers, especially speech prosody, acoustic communication, and technology. Barrett represent today a part of our ongoing uh, joint research about uncovering power relations through, di through dialogues analytics. Barrett? Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. And I see uh, that I share the screen. Um, I have another computer, everything is set. So again, good afternoon and good morning, and thank you again for joining us. I will talk about an ongoing research on dialogue analytics, which I carry out with Dr. Anat Lerner from the Open University of Israel. Let's start with demarcating this domain. Dialogue analytics is the processing of the massive amount of data that accumulate during talking interaction, including content, vocal features, and even body gestures and facial expressions. Researchers in this field are using methods from artificial intelligence and big data analytics to process massive data of quantitative parameters of the conversation. The goal is to achieve understanding of patterns, structures, and insights of this multifaceted type of communication. And today I will focus on insights that concern power relations, as the, as the title of this presentation suggests. This course analysis studies examine the way speakers project their identity and their social characteristics via content analysis. Positioning is a term mentioned by scholars to reflect a conversational phenomenon by, um, defined as the process whereby speakers' selves are located as perceptively and subjectively coherent participants in a jointly produced conversation. In speaking and acting, and acting from a position, a person is bringing to a particular situation her history as a sub subjective being. The term positioning it reflects the dynamic aspects of an interaction in contrast to the way in which the use of the term role serves, the role I play in a certain um, communication. Uh, like now I am a presenter, this is my role. So the role is emphasizing the static and formal aspects. In our studies, we have the same goal, but from a different perspective. What we want to understand is how the voice, actual voice of the individual reflects the way the participant is locating herself in certain contexts. We therefore use signal processing and acoustic analysis to study the intonation and rhythmic features, what is known as prosodic features. Traditional research in the field of power as manifested by the voice was mainly focused on the charismatic attributes of leaders within rhetoric studies. However, recent studies increasingly reveal the acoustic prosodic features of charismatic speech. Usually we ask, who is the dominant speaker when we want to study charisma? Dominancy can be the results of an official role of the speaker. However, however think about the tele a television panel. The professional broadcaster, the host of the panel, will be more dominant in many senses than the interviewee, even if the latter is the head of the state. Such a panel will, would expose power relations other than when the same leader is in a meeting with his ministers. So that's why we do research. And studies found that the most influential characteristic of conversation dominancy are 
the number of successful interruptions, the number of words spoken or otherwise speaking time, turn duration, turn is the stretches of speech when I speak before the other one is speaking, and the number of questions asked. Let's look on some measures in real interactions. So here's a um, study done by Bosker in 2017. He studied the three presidential debates in 2016 between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and he measured the number of interruptions defined as overlapping speech that one encountered during the three debates. Well, he found out that Trump interrupted Hillary 106 times, while Hillary interrupted Trump 27 times, and we are not so surprising, not so surprising. So I wanted to look at the very um, recent debate between Trump and Joe Biden and to see who spoke uh, more. This is the second measure that we talked. Uh, so it was already there, a day after the debate, when I um, Google it, a uh, speaking time of the debate, here it was from Statistica uh, website, um, and it showed this uh, very nice um, uh, histograms, and it turned out that both participants spoke quite the same, 39 minutes Donald Trump compared to almost 38 minutes of Joe Biden. Now, if we want to do research, we have to um, measure all, to, to, to include all participants. And I, as you see here, I also added um, Chris Wallace uh, and with a question mark because, because this is not, was not on the histogram. So let's look at uh, what I did. Well, I didn't have the time to measure the speaking time, it's too much processing. So I took the video indexer, which we will hear about on the last uh, talk by Eric Offer, and I, I um, it automatically, uh, the video indexer provided me with this um, uh, appearance time um, information. And it turned out that the portrait of each uh, of the participants uh, was um, chart was a, a distributed as follows. So Biden portrait the camera actually uh, looks at him uh, thirty six percent of the time, um, Trump twenty eight percent of the time. Very different from the speaking time rates. Remember, and Wallace was twenty one percent of the time. While there was also other other uh, camera uh, shootings of the audience or profile of the speaker, which is analyzed other, uh, in another uh, as other percentage. So this is interesting, and these are insights that can be gathered from, uh, from interviews. Uh, remember the, la the third measure that I mentioned uh, for measuring charismatic speech was turn duration. And uh, this I did, uh, did uh, for the two, uh, two uh, interviews. Uh, in 2019 elections, the first elections uh, between uh, the one, the first uh, uh, interview of Bibi Netanyahu in Channel 12, compared to uh, Benny Gantz uh, interview in Ynet um, um, studios, and it turned out that their turn duration is actually the same, and there is no uh, significant um, difference between the two. Uh, so the turn average duration of Bibi was one, one second and 79 uh, millisecond, uh, and Gantz was one second 75. So also this was, although all the Hebrew uh, listeners here, participants, can, could quite say that probably Bibi Netanyahu is more charismatic and dominant speaker, however, not in terms of turn duration, and Benny Gantz at that time had very, very little experience as a political leader. <laughs> Back to Bosker 2017, uh, he measured 
uh, another uh, acoustic uh, parameter, which is called rhythmic amplitude modulations. And comparison of the amplitude spectra of Hillary Clinton's and Donald Trump's speech revealed con considerably greater power in the modulation spectrum of Clinton's speech than in that of Trump's speech. What does this mean? This means that Hillary had more pronounced syllabic amplitude fluctuation in her speech, which improved her intelligibility in the noisy environment of a live debate. And remember, Trump interrupted her a lot of time. And also, it is interpreted as her public speaking experience. She was very, uh, also calm, but this is what her strategy is, to be very intelligible and to use her highs and lows, those fluctuations. Donald Trump, however, was considerably more disfluent than Clinton. Particularly, he used many repetitions, repairs, and abandoned utterances. This suggest suggested that Trump used less rehearsed utterances compared to Clinton. Now, if we ask who is dominant and who is not, not necessarily Hillary is more dominant than, than uh, Trump, but they use different strategies to show their dominance. Until now, I mentioned measures that reveal static findings. If we talk, for example, on overlaps, we found that overlaps in Hebrew dialogues span from 1% to 15% per dialogue. You can see here also that the distribution of speaking ratios of two speakers and the silent pauses and overlaps in eight dialogues, okay, each histogram is one dialogue information, and we can get interesting insights from such a comparison. However, our goal is to reach dynamic representations that will reveal what was the process during the interaction. So the uh, top uh, percentage are the, uh, the rates of, this, of the overlap speech. And this is the silences ratios. You see that there are several differences uh, in spontaneous speech and also the speaking time of the, of the participants, etc. So let's look at the dynamic. So here is one dialogue representation. The white space is talking ratios of one speaker, the leader, we call him. The dark blue space is a second speaker and the light blue is, are the overlaps ratios along the course of the conversation. So we have on the x-axis the uh, time sign. This type of analysis allows us to understand the story of the dialogue from a bird eyes view. In our study, we modeled interactions in a manner that enables comparisons. Look at the upper right figure. It reflects two speakers and their speaking time along the dialogue. How do the other three interactions look like? Hypothetically, they can look like that. So now we are able to compare between different dialogues and to find if there are exceptions, like the one in the upper left case. Back to 2019 interview that I mentioned before, this is the speaking rates of both participants along the interview. By now we can zoom in and find what was said at points of divergence and at point of convergence. Comparisons between dialogues can be of interest for gender studies. Here we analyze hundreds of dialogues and group them into gender pairings. For example, MM is male representative with male customer. FF, female representative with female customers. Male, female, female, male. We extracted seven acoustic features and this is their average representations along the dialogues. Each group has its own pattern and mostly the FM pairs are different from the other, others. So indeed, in a more qualitative study, we 
found that what we call the interlocutor effect. We found that women are more dominant with a male partner than with a female. This was one of our findings. And here you can joke on this with this um, joke. When I speak, when you, and you answer, it interferes with dialogue between us. Yeah, I like this joke. And last, before I finish, I want to talk briefly about the convergence phenomenon that I mentioned before, because we also found cultural differences in this respect. We found a greater tendency for divergence of Hebrew speakers' behavior, particularly among mixed gender speaker pairs, compared to Indo-European languages. And role-wise, we found that speakers who depend on information tend to match their interlocutors more closely than those who possess it. So dominancy is also a matter of getting closer or farther from your interlocutor. To summarize, dialogue analysis has interdisciplinary contributions, among them technological, we wish to automatically uh, identify uh, the speaker's role and attitudes towards his conversational partners. Linguistically, we want to understand the vocal message in the context of the conversation. And we want to reach conversation as a unit of analysis, like in discourse analysis. And also cultural studies. We want to enrich insights of the cultural heritage of video and audio collections and at least I consider political interviews and debates as important part of our cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Ina Blau. I'm a professor of educational technology and cyber psychology at the Open University of Israel, and I'm the chair of this session. And this last session is um, focusing on uh, audio mining. We have two presenters. The first presenter is my colleague and research collaborator, Dr. Tamar Shamirin Ba. Uh, she is a faculty member at the Department of Education and Psychology at the Open University of Israel. Her research focuses on integration of innovation technologies in academia and in K-12. Um, she explores the role of uh, pedagogical design in technology-enhanced learning and online learning. Tamar holds a PhD in technology and science education from Technion, the Israeli Institute of Technology. And her presentation today will discuss uh, learning processes through annotations in a hyper video environment called Anon. Tamar, Thank you, Ina. the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sharing my, uh, oops, wait a second. Okay. So hi everybody. Um, the, my name is Tamar, just as like Ina said, and we we'll work together. And the topic I am going to present today is about using an annotation written on a hyper video learning environment named Anoto. Um, Anoto's purpose is to promote active. Uh, student learning here at the Israeli Open University. So the main question is, what is Anoto? Anoto is a hyper video application that we have used for the last few years as a resource for enhancing teaching and learning activity. The university added these uh, new features to the learning environment in order to use it in various courses. An auto application enables students and lecturers to write personal and shared comments on recorded video, just as you can see here uh, in this picture on the right side. We can also see these comments on specific points on the video's timeline, as you can see here at the bottom of the picture. Um, Turning the videoing process in recorded lessons into active participation can be done through different types of interaction. For example, active participation can be done through uh, personal interaction, which means uh, 
participants write in professional notes related to the learning content can be done by shared interaction, which enables lecturers or students to share the insight or questions with one another, and by reflections on the learning content, which enables students to reflect on their learning and their understanding. According to previous study, although we know that active learning is essential to absorbing the new learning content, uh, uh, most of the participants using hyper video systems are lurking. This means that they are mostly watching the video or reading the comments of others, but they are not contributing their own annotation to the learning group. We also know um, that in non-credit hyper video activities, only about 10% of the learners choose to be active, which means that they contribute the annotations in order to share them with others. Students have to be motivated in order to become active, active participants. So according to the literature, motivational factors that enhance participation in online communities can be grouped in four main categories. The nature of online community, the personal preference according to individual characteristics, the degree of group commitment regarding the influence of the learning environment and the connection with peers or lecturers, and the last category is learning requirements of the course. There are several strategies that are suggested in the literature for motivating student participation. These include external stimuli, such as improving students' grade or status, increasing social interaction among students, direct encouragement for participation, and assisting new learners. This table uh, show, shows the community of inquiry framework, which divides student writing in forms into three categories, cognitive, teaching, and social presence. Each category has subcategories and indicators. So cognitive presence can be done through triggering events, which is the basic type to evoke student interest in order to continue the learning process. Then the exploration category refers to the exchange of information and discussion of unclear issues. And finally, the integration category in which ideas are combined and a solution to a problem is found. Then the teaching process, uh, presents deal deals with different teaching methods leading uh, to practical issues in the teaching process. This is expressed through focusing on a discussion in providing answers to questions or in diagnosing errors and summarizing learning topics. Social presence involves emotional uh, responses based on the learning climate and a group identity. It consists of categories such as emotional expressions and use of emoticons, humor, or self-disclosure. Sometimes it can be done by using social expressions such as hi, thanks, hopefully this helps, calling others by the names and using expression that emphasize a sense of belonging to the, to the group, such as we, our course, and so on. So uh, through our experience in using hyper video system, our study goals were to investigate active participation of students in hyper video environment and to understand the role of the lecturer as the pedagogical designer of hyper video learning. And also to analyze share hyper video annotations in terms of cognitive teaching and social presence based on the community of inquiry model. Anoto was used as a pilot experiment as a non-credit hyper video activity in three large undergraduate courses in exact sciences 
and social sciences in, the, in a large sample of students. So in the Israeli Open University, all the synchronous lessons are recorded and then uploaded to the course site. This allows students to repeat the content uh, of the lesson. Uh, therefore, the Anoto application can be integrated into these lessons in order to enable students to respond later to the learning content. Throughout this study, we conducted semi-structured interviews with lecturers and some of the most active students in order to explore their perspective on, uh, on using Anoto as an optimal part of the course design. Further, we conducted content analysis of the most interactive lecture, lectures of each course. Uh, this content analysis was done according to community of inquiry framework as presented before. So um, I will present our finding according to interviews and content analysis. The finding raised several issues such as active participation versus lurking, the potential for collaborative learning in using Anoto, the potential of encouraging personal reflection, and pedagogical design expressed in epistemologic, epistemological beliefs and interaction patterns. The content analysis will be presented through community of inquiry framework which is based on cognitive teaching and social presence. The first part in the finding section is about active participation versus lurking in hypervideo. So although lecturers and students clearly understand the potential of using hypervideo in learning, most of their participation was not that active. For example, one of the lecturers said, I would like them to ask more questions. I like it when they ask and I love to answer. I think it's student mentality not to ask, to be passive, to lean on materials created by lecturers. Active students also understood the potential of active learning when using annotations. So during the interviews with them, they reported that they liked the idea of, of uh, active discussion but the interaction with their peers was shallow, just as you can see in the second quote in this, in the bottom of the slide. The second part in the finding section is about the potential for collaborative learning in using Anoto. Accordingly, students understood the potential for collaborative learning and the advantages of being active in hypervideo is a tool to promote the understanding. For example, some of the students said, sharing enables us to see peers' perspective. It shows another way to think about the subject, helps to remember content and connect to it. And another student said, I wrote questions on the video timeline and the lecture answered me. Further, I wrote many notes on the recorded videos I am sure I help other students with the uh, comments that I wrote on the recordings. The third part in the finding section is about the pedagogical, the, the potential of hyper video for, for reflection. So students and lecturers see the importance of being able to reflect on the learning process and content. For example, uh, one of the lectures said, this tool can assist my teaching. It pushes students to be active, to stop watching the videos and ask themselves, do I understand? A similar idea about reflection on the learning process, we can see in some of the students' statements. For example, one of the students said, using the hyper video tool, gave me the opportunity to watch again, to be a more active learner, study through another channel, and experience a different way of learning. The fourth part in, in the finding section is about epistemology in pedagogical design. 
In this study, we found that lecturers and students shared a similar epistemology according to the question, what is the right pedagogical design of an academic course, which is a very important question. So accordingly, the lecturer's role is to lead the discussion and control the course material. For example, one of the lecturers said, it is impossible to conduct student discussion without my intervention. They are a uh, provide wrong answer. I have to follow the discussion, I have to correct. I do not see the added value in student discussions by themselves. In any case, they are waiting for me to tell them the correct answer. And we can see also students that express the same concept and perceive the lecture as the knowledge authority, the only one that can give them the right answer. And more than that, because students perceive their lecture as the knowledge authority, they waited for approval from him and not from their peers. Just as you can see in the second quotes here, I want to receive the correct answer from the lecture and not a student's opinion. This means that both lecturers and students seem to hold traditional epistemological perspectives on the teaching learning process. The next part in the finding section is about pedagogical design that led the interaction pattern in the course. So analysis revealed that the main pattern of the shared dialogue was students' question and lecture answers. According to the lecturers, this is the unique advantage in using an auto. They claim that questions and answer in hyper video can replace discussion in forums, but in a specific point of interest on the video's timeline. Moreover, conducting dialogue between peers is nice to have through an auto, but they did not perceive it as important and worthwhile to promote. And the last part in the finding section deal with uh, the content analysis based on community of inquiry framework, which also raised some interesting finding. So as I said before, the most interactive lecture of each course was chosen for the content analysis of the annotation uh, that lecturers and students wrote on the recorded videos. According to the finding, we see that all type of presence suggested by the community of inquiry framework in digital forms were also mapped in hyper video annotations in our data. This means that community of inquiry framework can be useful for analyzing uh, academic discussions regardless of the technolo technological pat uh, platform. And in our study, we found that cognitive presence was very dominant in the content analysis, but it shows mainly triggering events and fewer subcategory such as integration, exploration, or resolution. Just as you can see here in these quotes, uh, I did not understand the differences between case A and B. I would be happy to receive a clearer explanation. Teaching presence, was the second most common presence and it was based mostly on direct instruction rather than on promoting discussion. For example, true, the value should be to read again the instruction and, and so on. The most salient type of presence was the social presence, especially seems and vote an emoticon, but in order to, but in order to subcategories such as open communication or, or group co cohesion, uh, we couldn't see them at all. So you can see these are the emoticons that we have in our Anoto application. So our conclusion were as follow. Lecturers and students perceive the unique potential uh, of the hyper video for promoting active learning in writing personal notes or in sharing their ideas. 
in the traditional teaching learning approach, we see that even though Anoto is an innovative tool, the lecturers keep their need for control and many students also keep their desire to get the correct answer from the lecture, of course, as the knowledge authority, even though they are willing to hear their peers' ideas. The main pattern uh, of sharing interactions through the Anoto tool as found in this pile of research was lecturers' answer to students' questions. There was almost no peer dialogue or peer feedback. Finally, these are, these are our recommendations for implementing such an innovative tool in the course design. So first, innovative technology by itself does not change pedagogy or epistemology. Therefore, changes in pedagogical design need to occur. We recommended promoting an interaction pattern such as asking open question as a trigger to student dialogue in order to reach high, high level thinking. And we also recommended to continue research in this issue, perhaps giving academic credit for using Anoto as a learning tool in order to encourage active participation of lecturers and students in different learning patterns. And thank you for your listening. Thank you, Tamar. We have five minutes for questions. Our second presenter is Dr. Irit Offer. Um, Dr. Offer leads the applied research team that forms a part of, of the media um, group at the Microsoft Israel Development Center. Prior to joining um, the Microsoft, she was uh, the head of the Center for Language Processing at Afeka Academic College of Engineering. Dr. Offer has a wide experience in machine learning uh, and content anal analytics and she specializes um, at, in speak, um, speech recognition and pattern analysis. She holds a PhD in physics from Tel Aviv University. And today she will speak about extracting multimodal insights with video indexers. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Ina, for presenting me. And Vered, thank you very much for inviting me over to this seminar. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting Video Indexer uh, to you. And uh, before I start, I, I do want to comment since uh, this is, first of all, the, the last lecture, I think, of, of this seminar. Uh, and uh, also, since Video Indexer and Machine Learning came up quite a lot during um, the, uh, the, the, the other talks. So two, two comments that I wasn't planning on, on elaborating on, but I do want to... to to, to, to say something, sorry. So we machine learning or speech scientists or whatever you would call us, um, I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, I usually tell my students that uh, we worship the God of statistics. So first of all, this is something that uh, we all need to bear in mind, okay? Machine learning learns from data and requires a lot of statistics and also has to be evaluated in terms of statistical measures meaning um, we aim at a, a, a wide variety of cases, but we cannot do magic. I mean, if there is a, what we would call a corner case or a unique environment that uh, our system has not encountered during what we call the training process, um, it is quite likely that we will not be able to deal with it. Quite similar, by the way, uh, to a person that you would put in a street uh, in a type of street that they have never seen before, like with no street signs or nothing else, and you would ask them to navigate without a map there. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I mean, when, when we are totally in unfamiliar territories, it's true for people and for machine learning, it's a challenge, okay? So this is something that I just wanted to give a context for that. And now I can share my screen and start my uh, presentation. Um, Wait, I need, okay, I hope that I will be sharing the um, audio as well. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, um, um, I come from uh, Microsoft. I'm uh, part of the Media AI group, 
and I manage the applied research team that uh, specializes in video analytics. And what I'm going to present today is uh, the video indexer, which is a powerful tool uh, that extracts multimodal insights from uh, video and audio files. So, wait. Whoa. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, the internet is full of video and audio files, and we uh, like to relate to them as unstructured data, as opposed to structured data like uh, records of your uh, phone uh, bill and, and other types of records that have fields and have specific values that you find into these fields. Um, we try, we aim at converting the unstructured data into structured data or actually into searchable archives. Now, just to give you a little, uh, uh, a little numbers, okay, uh, it is estimated that 100 million photos and videos per day are posted through Instagram. Um, every, mi uh, every minute, 4 million videos are watched over YouTube. Uh, and YouTube, and by the way, there are also other platforms like Vimeo or other uh, video platforms, meaning the internet is full of video and audio files. And same as uh, historians or uh, researchers of oral history or education uh, would like to have their archives uh, searchable easily for different types of content that answer different types of constraints, uh, also, other um, organizations, for example, a large network, broadcast networks, or other, or even intelligence um, uh, organizations or law enforcement organizations, they have tons of uh, um, video and audio hours, and they would like to search them. And Video Indexer is trying to assist in such uh, a mission. And uh, the buzzword that uh, repeats uh, itself in the last, I don't know, 20 plus years is, of course, the machine learning that uh, nowadays, by the way, is almost synonym to deep neural networks. But at the beginning uh, of at least my days in machine learning, it was not a synonym. And also today, not, it, it's also important to, to remember that not all machine learning relies on deep learning. And deep learning is an amazing tool but it doesn't always fit any problem that we want to address. So, as I said, Video Indexer takes either video or audio files, indexes them, I'll explain in a minute what does it mean to index, and provides insights. Uh, I hope you can see all them. So we provide multiple types of insights. For example, we, uh, um, we, we use um, uh, Microsoft Speech Services in order to extract the transcription of uh, the conversation in the video. We uh, employ face detection, telling us where in each frame is a face presented. And for example, we have other types of insights. Uh, for example, something that relates more to the media and entertainment um, vertical of our business. Uh, we can detect rolling credits, um, which is helpful, for example, as you have uh, in Netflix, if you want to jump to the new episode and skip the rolling credits. We also extract textual input from the, the visual modality by OCR. So uh, I'll try to cover all these uh, items. And uh, if we will be out of time, I'll skip to the uh, oral history examples uh, to make sure that we cover um, uh, the, the most important part of uh, my talk here at this seminar. Uh, so. Uh, this is how Video Indexer looks. Actually, we do have a little uh, change and we have a slightly newer portal, but uh, to, give you, um, to give you the idea, this is still, you can uh, view the, uh, um, the video and of course play it. And here on the right, you have multiple insights. This is our portal. All the insights extraction that I'm going to show you and more are also addressed via an API, meaning people who, uh, um, write code or even write what we call logic apps, which is a way to write code without actually writing code, can uh, access these insights not through the portal, not through manual indexing, rather through um, uh, batch processing, meaning you can actually uh, um, access and, and analyze and uh, index hundreds and thousands of video files without having to upload each one of them separately to our portal. But it's much easier to show, of course, through the portal. So, 
Uh, as I said, um, we have uh, mostly two types of modalities, a visual modality, where we extract, for example, um, objects. We, uh, as I said earlier, we extract the OCR, optical character recognition, which we translate, quote unquote, textual input that appears on the screen into actual searchable text. And we have man, many insights on the video level, for example, uh, the rolling credits that I showed earlier, or uh, the faces that I will elaborate on in a few minutes. And on the auditory domain, we have the speaker and the speech and the acoustics uh, that we analyze and also Jared showed earlier how uh, it is um, uh, helpful to use for, for example, for oral history uh, interviews. Now, uh, the speech and the OCR serve for um, what we call higher level insights that are not extracted directly from either the audio track or the visual track. Um, we extract topics out of this transcription and the OCR. We extract named entities. We, we actually uh, have something like 30 different types of insights extracted by machine learning abilities from each video file or audio, audio files. Of course, when you index only audio files, uh, you don't get the visual domain at all, of course. So um, let's focus first on the visual domain and uh, drill down a little bit on it. I will try to be brief, so I will not cover all of these. Uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, um, inform uh, visual information that we extract is face detection which serves later for face recognition. The detection tells you where in a frame or in, during the video uh, a face is detected and the recognition allows us to actually recognize previously enrolled people to, uh, 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 on the video. We also have animated character recognition. This is less relevant for, uh, I guess, oral res uh, history researchers, but it's cool. And um, as I said earlier, we have uh, visual labels that we extract from the video. The labels contain both um, uh, objects like a person or sky, and also what, what we would call lower level concepts like standing, a meeting, sunset. Uh, it, it, it's not actions, but it's sort of uh, some concept that can be extracted from an image. Um, on, on the video label, this is uh, more relevant, I would say, uh, to um, broadcast uh, networks, so less relevant for, for researchers, our content moderation, uh, the rolling credits detection that I mentioned earlier, and also um, segmentation into temporal units such as scenes and shots. These are relevant for uh, professional video editors. So just to give you a glimpse of how the face detection and grouping looks, and here I would also like to say that um, one of the things that we need all to remember is that um, a video is much more than um, a collection of frames, okay? So analyzing static images would not constitute to analyzing the video. We have temporal information in the video and we truly try to rely on this temporal information and uh, also overcome it in some cases uh, when needed, when we analyze um, the video. For example, here, we detected many, many, many people here, all of them unknown to the, to, to the, um, uh, to the system. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Not, <coughs> Not COVID. <laughs> Bless you. Simply, thank you. Simply talking too much, as my uh, young son would say. Um, uh, so, um, you can see here that this person here appeared a few times in the video. Now, we are able to group all the instances where this person appeared and actually say <clears throat> that this is the same person. Okay, even though, by the way, you can see that at different instances in the video, this person wears different um, uh, dresses and also looks to different angles what we would call pose, has different poses uh, in front of the camera. Um, once we have uh, detected the faces, we can send them to a um, mechanism that is called celebrity face recognition. 
So here, for example, uh, quite recent, by the way, a discussion about COVID prior to uh, Trump uh, contract, uh, con contracting COVID himself. Uh, and you can see here that we can ascertain that at the same time, these three people were present at the same frame. So this is a kind of insights that we can extract from video indexer from our facial recognition mechanism. Uh, I'll skip the credits, sorry, uh, to, to make it faster. Um, here I would just <clears throat> like to note, uh, showing you some challenges that we have, um, that, uh, I don't know, can, can you see, by the way? Um, oh, sorry, that's better. Um, uh, you can see here, I mean, as a person, we all um, can complete uh, the M behind uh, uh, the person here and say, this is Microsoft, and we also complete the F and the T that were not present. But a machine needs needs to learn to do that, okay? Because uh, uh, basically the, the letters here are, are not fully Microsoft. Our OCR uh, mechanism that looks at adjacent frames can actually use a context of what we've seen previous and after a frame and actually capture the full word even if at some instances the word is occluded. So uh, jumping to the auditory uh, modality or domain, what type of insights can we extract here? So. Uh, something that Varen mentioned earlier, we employ a very simple voice activity detector that tells you when speech was uttered during the video and uh, when it was not uttered. So this very simple information is very helpful, as you've seen earlier, in an analyzing the amount of time uh, a person speaks because we can add to it uh, what we call speaker diarization, which is a diary of the speakers we do not identify the speakers here in Video Indexer. This is a service, by the way, that is available in preview, I think, by Microsoft uh, Cognitive Services. But we do, however, can say when, uh, what segments belong to a specific speaker. So here we see speaker A spoke, then B, then A again, and then C. So uh, crossing the information from the speaker organization to the voice activity detector actually can tell you who spoke when, at least in terms of speaker A, B, and C. And if you know, for example, that your speaker A is uh, President Trump and your speaker B is Biden, you can do the analysis of the type that they uh, showed earlier. Uh, relating to the content, we identify the language, the spoken language. And once we do identify the language, we send the audio track to the relevant speech recognition engine that extracts for us the transcription as we will see in a few minutes. Um, okay, I'm going to show part of a demo here, uh, which is uh, of another uh, preview feature that we have in Video Indexer, where we actually uh, detect the languages in a multiple lingual uh, conversation. Here, for example, this is a meeting uh, between um, President Trump and Macron, I think. Well, forgot forgot the name of the uh, president. Yeah, Macron, uh, of the French president. And and you can see here. Um, I'll start it. Summer. Now we are thrilled to host you. He quickly won the trust of George Washington, fought bravely in the battle, heard the Americans to storm the cliff. I'm stopping for a minute. So here you can see all the instances where the spoken language was English and the uh, captions that are uh, uh, formed by the automatic transcription um, are, of course, in English, whereas if we... Uh, but also to the oceans, to biodiversity, and to all forms of pollution. À présent, c'est nous qui avons la joie de vous accueillir, vous et Brigitte, ici en Amérique. Okay, I'll stop here uh, for the sake of time. But you can see here that what we do is we analyze the audio track here, and we detect uh, where 
English is spoken, where um, French is spoken, and send them the relevant segments to the relevant speech recognition engine. Uh, so this is very useful, for example, for analyzing um, press conferences, or maybe, for example, um, uh, interviews, uh, for, let's say, by um, uh, elderly people who speak a specific language but understand another language and want to answer in their own language. Okay, uh, something that uh, may uh, uh, relate also to issues that were raised uh, a little earlier, both I think by Imbal and by Vered, and that goes to uh, something that um, characterizes uh, Microsoft machine learning um, offering, which is the ability to customize various insights that to make them fit, to make them better fit for the data of a specific customer. Um, if you remember when I started talking, I uh, said something about machine learning, learning from uh, uh, data. Now, um, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, no matter how much data we will collect, we will never collect all the relevant uh, data for a very specific use case. So, for example, we can customize some of our insights let's see the language model, which is the um, statistical uh, model that relates to the um, uh, collocations and engrams of what combinations of words are more likely to happen in a language. So each um, domain uh, has their own um, uh, underlying vocabulary or unique vocabulary for technology technological co uh, conversations or videos, we would have uh, a word like Kubernetes, which I imagine most of you are not familiar with. And in academic or history um, uh, videos, there would be uh, um, a, a term that I just learned, which is hermeneutics. And I was not familiar with that term uh, uh, at all, of course. Uh, another thing is that some words may actually uh, be present in multiple um, uh, modalities, in multiple content uh, um, worlds, but have different meanings and have different combinations. So the idea of the customizing a language model is to better fit the uh, speech to text to a specific jargon and a specific um, uh, environment in terms of linguistic environment. So I'll skip, um, here, and I'll, I'll just go quickly to uh, how it's sort of done. Um, we look at combinations of words. Let's say we are only looking at what we call bigrams, uh, statistics of pairs of words. Now, prior to uh, the COVID situation, uh, Corona was mostly uh, mentioned as a beer or a brand. Coronavirus was a combination that if it existed, existed very, very, very uh, rarely. Um, so if we are now to transcribe conversations or videos that um, mention the coronavirus, we would like this combination to have a higher weight in our language model. How do we do that? We uh, go to the internet, we collect multiple instances of um, mentions of the coronavirus and we take the context because uh, language models learn from context and then uh, this is of course not normalized uh, for those of you who are familiar with these terms and then we are able to increase the percentage of uh, occurrences that the corona comes with the word virus in different types of sentences in our training material for the language model. Now I didn't um, prepare a demo to show you this, but in every um, account of my video indexer, you can do that with your own texts, and you can actually um, introduce your specific jargon, your uh, specific vocabulary, and customize the language model. It will take a few minutes to retrain, and once if you uh, uh, index next videos in your account, you can uh, tell your video indexer account to use the customized language model that should be better suited for your needs. Uh, a word of caution, it does not solve all the problems. For example, dialectical um, problems, as I think Inbal mentioned earlier, if people speak 
in a very, very uh, unique dialect. That's an acoustic issue. It's not a language model issue. So this will not solve this problem. So uh, coming to maximum five minutes more, if you want to have time. Okay. For Great. Okay. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm skipping to uh, the actual uh, uh, example of the historical record. So um, uh, the, the idea, and, and um, there are many, many uh, insights in video indexer. So I, I will. I, I didn't have time to, to show all of them, uh, but I wanted to show you how um, a, um, a history um, record. Sorry seems to have jumped here, is uh, present here. So let's start. Uh, I indexed here a, a short video about uh, Winston Churchill. And um, he was an action hero. He was a historian. He was a journalist. He combined incredible decision making, very clear decision making, with amazing rhetorical skills. Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was born into a wealthy family on November 30th, 1874. Okay, so you can see here that the transcript uh, fits the text, the uh, audio track. Here we can see that video indexer actually... He was an action hero. War wars in South Africa, that was... The first Lord of the Admiral. After World War I. Eight people consider Winston Churchill a potential... Okay, I'm skipping uh, just a minute here, uh, stopping it. You can see the video indexer can actually uh, recognize all the instances where Winston Churchill well, not all of them, maybe, but uh, many, many instances where Winston Churchill appears in this video. Now, uh, we can also recognize other people there. For example, Tom Brock. He went off to war very early, first as a correspondent. He'd made a decision about... Irit, can you um, enlarge the, the window so it will be more clear for the participants? Um, let me try. Uh, is that better? Yes, I can't see, uh, I can't uh, um, access my, uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Wait, um, let me, no. Okay, that's, uh, that's a problem here. Um, okay, I, <laughs> now we're stuck. Never mind, we go back. <laughs> Okay. Zoom out, zoom out. Sorry about that. No, I, I lost the, um, uh, I lost uh, um, the. Yeah. You have to zoom out uh, with a um, mouse. Yeah. Sorry? Control and mouse, mm -hmm. maybe. No, it's not working. I, ah. <laughs> okay. push, push the escape button. I'll, I'll just stop sharing and, uh, oh. Cool. Very good. Yeah, that was that made it. Okay, uh, we're using Teams, not Zoom. <laughs> uh, okay. The the idea here is that I wanted to show uh, multiple uh, um, uh, multiple insights like the faces, the labels that we discussed earlier. Look that uh, we realized that this is a black and white movie, or at least a, 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 a has some black and white uh, um, uh, frames there, and we recognize all sorts of named entities here. Okay, skipping um, to uh, um, uh, another uh, customizing um, ability. Uh, we can customize the faces here. For example, this person here, the uh, Joshua Good, was not previously enrolled to our celebrity recognition um, uh, corpus. Uh, that makes sense, actually. I mean, uh, as opposed to Winston Churchill or Roosevelt or Stalin, uh, uh, this is not such a famous person. But what we can do is we can edit um, the person as we have uh, their name here. And uh, next, uh, we um, uh, behind the, the, the scene, um, video indexer now, or actually uh, face recognition uh, interface by Microsoft, actually now knows that this person here is Joshua Good. And whenever I will edit another video using video indexer uh, at my account, this person will be recognized by the, his name. Um, so uh, just one last uh, example, uh, not a video here. Um, I started by saying that we can, we are aiming at making unstructured data searchable to make, to make it structure. For example, I could search 
for an, uh, all videos on my archive where uh, Professor Amy Woodson Bolton uh, spoke uh, about military history in wars, since this is one of the topics here, and uh, where, uh, for example, uh, uh, Roosevelt appears or appears with Stalin together. So such uh, search is, um, is available uh, by our search mechanism and also by what we call post-processing of a large file of insights that you can always download um, once you have finished indexing a video. Uh, so um, I'll summarize here. Um, a video indexer allows you to index multimodal insights, uh, extract multimodal insights out of videos and audio files. Um, one important uh, feature of uh, Video Indexer is that for some of the insights, we allow customization to better fit our analysis to your specific content. And uh, as uh, we saw here, it is definitely suitable for uh, historical research and historical analysis. And uh, first of all, I um, urge you to uh, try it out yourself. We allow um, uh, a trial account where you can index, I forgot the number of minutes for free, but quite a lot of uh, video and audio minutes can be indexed uh, uh, without uh, even any cost. And, um, uh, and later on, you can uh, actually do that, of course, um, uh, with cost. We are a commercial company. And uh, I also invite anyone who has any interest in learning more or came across some problems that you're not sure whether video indexer can um, solve or whether you think you uh, may need some push in uh, overcoming some technological barriers in order to use video indexer, I truly welcome you uh, to, to write to me. I, I will leave my, my email later on in the chat window. And uh, one last uh, comment for uh, our local uh, audience. Uh, we are working on Hebrew. I cannot guarantee a specific date, but it's already in progress and I'm making a lot of effort to have Hebrew added to Video Indexer as well. Thank you, very Thank you so much.